Tommy, e Jesus, you have gone and done it now. You have stopped preaching and gone to meddling. Yes, today's scripture may be excerpted from the greatest sermon you ever preached, the Sermon on the Plain, probably better known to us as the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew's Gospel. But we're not in Matthew's Gospel. We're in Luke's Gospel, and you have gone and done it, Jesus. You are mixing ideology with religion, politics, and faith. You're excit- inciting class warfare with your beatitude. Blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. What in heaven and on earth do you mean? Well, the problem of poverty is staggering. Half of the world's population, nearly 3 billion people, live on less than $2.50 a day. That's less than a latte at Caribou Coffee at Friendly Center. The gross domestic product of the 48 poorest nations, representing a quarter of all the countries in the world, is less than the wealth of the three richest people combined. You heard me correctly. Three people have more money than 48 nations, or a quarter of the nations on earth. Over a billion people can't sign their name or read a book. According to UNICEF, 22,000 children die each day due to poverty. And they die quietly in some of the poorest villages on earth, far removed from the scrutiny and conscience of the world. Being meek and weak in life makes these dying multitudes even more invisible in death. That is 154,000 children dead each week. Or just over 8 million children under 5 dead each year. Well, these figures are all the more startling when you and I realize the things that we spend our time and attention on each year. Consider these annual global priorities in spending. $8 billion a year on cosmetics in the United States. $11 billion on ice cream in Europe. $12 billion on perfumes in Europe and the U.S. $17 billion on pet food in Europe and the United States. $35 billion on business entertainment in Japan alone. And $780 billion spent on the military worldwide. And then consider what the estimated cost to eradicate poverty and achieve these universal services would be worldwide. It would cost only $6 billion for basic education for all. $9 billion for water and sanitation for all. $12 $12 billion for reproductive health for all. $13 billion for basic health and nutrition for approximately $40 billion a year. Give or take a few billion, you and I could eradicate extreme poverty. According to the United Methodist Conference of Bishops, the Presbyterian Church General Assembly, the United States Council of Catholic Bishops, just to name a few, all agree that the Christian church could eradicate extreme poverty worldwide in this generation if and only if good Christian people like you and me would just commit the resources. What in heaven and on earth are we to make of Jesus' teaching? Blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Well, as we wrestle with Jesus' words, you and I would be wise to avoid a number of misreadings of Jesus' teaching. Whatever else Jesus may be doing here, he's surely turning conventional wisdom on its head. The temptation to interpret this unconventional wisdom in ways that domesticate it is the temptation to evade Jesus. Jesus wants to unsettle all who hear this sermon. Jesus wants to get our attention. Jesus wants all who follow him to understand the radical nature of being a Christian. 
God's ways and values are not the world's ways and values. Jesus wants to shock us, wake us up, cause us not to sleep very well at night. And so he says, blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. But you and I, we equivocate, we hem and haw. When we hear Jesus' bold statement, blessed are the poor, we spiritualize the poverty. We say things like, oh, well, Luke just heard Jesus wrong that day. Luke recorded blessed are the poor, but what Luke meant to record was what Matthew says in his gospel that Jesus said. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Yeah, That's the ticket. Blessed are the poor is really blessed are the poor in spirit. And you know, that really means blessed are the humble. And while I can't be poor, I can be humble. And humility is a good thing. Poor people and rich people can be humble. So let's be humble together. But this is Luke's gospel, not Matthew's. And Luke reminds us that Jesus in his first sermon in his hometown of Nazareth says this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. So I think that I'm going to go fundamentalist here and suggest that when Jesus says, Blessed are the poor, Jesus means exactly what Jesus says. Blessed are the poor. Well, another misunderstanding I've heard is one that goes like this. Blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. I am not poor, and God willing, I will never be poor. And furthermore, if you have to be poor in order to receive God's blessings as a Christian, you can sign me up for another religion. Because I don't think that I'm going to give up any of the good stuff, the wealth that I enjoy anytime soon. Good for you, Jesus. Give the poor hope for a reward in the life to come and let me get on enjoying my life right here and now. Blessed are the poor. What in heaven and on earth do you mean by that? Well, I do think that there is one thing that you and I can do, maybe to obey, if not the letter of Jesus' teaching, then at least the spirit of his teaching. Blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. It has been said, and and I think it's true, that Jesus makes implicit commands in his blessings here in the Sermon on the Plain. When Jesus teaches that the poor are divinely favored, for example, what Jesus wants his hearers, his disciples, in other words, us to understand, is that we are to treat the poor in exactly the same way that God treats the poor. We are to treat them well because God treats them as blessed. Fred Craddock writes, as pronouncements on the lips of Jesus, the Beatitudes are performative. That's to say, the words have the power to perform or make true the kind of presence in the statement. Jesus is expressing God's solidarity, what theologians call God's preferential option for the poor. God is predisposed to the poor. You and I might be tempted to look around and say, Well, for all the good, God's favor does them. But that's Jesus' understanding nevertheless. That God is preferentially predisposed to the poor. Blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Then this statement simply means God loves poor folks. And because God loves them, You and I and the church are to love them too. And we are to work for the poor and their blessedness. 
just as surely as God does. And what does all this loving the poor, this caring for the poor, this working for the blessedness of the poor look like? Well, I think Jesus sums it all up in just a few verses later in Luke chapter 6 when he says, Do to others as you would have them do to you. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer them the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you and if anyone takes away your goods do not ask for them again sounds ridiculous naive to our contemporary years doesn't it and it probably sounded equally ridiculous to the people who were hearing Jesus for the first time too why would I want to love someone who hates me Why in the world would I let someone hit me once, let alone twice? If someone steals from me, am I not to seek restitution? Ridiculous. But this is what Jesus says love looks like. This is what a blessed life entails. This is the way of God. It is the values of the kingdom of God. God loves regardless, regardless of how you look, smell, speak, act, or react. God loves you regardless of where you come from or where you were born, what you've done to yourself or to others. God loves you in spite of the size of your bank account. God loves and blesses regardless As children of God, as followers of Jesus, as those committed to living out the kingdom values and not the world's, you and I are obligated to display this same kind of love and care and blessing that God has. Love that is demonstrated regardless of circumstance or situation is the way of God's love. Love that is demonstrated regardless of person or stature or status is the way of God's love. Love that is demonstrated without expectation is the way of God's love. Love that is demonstrated by the rich on behalf of the poor is the way of God's love. It's expressed expecting nothing in return, simply sacrificially and solely because it is the right godly gospel thing to do. This kind of love and blessing is radical. It's countercultural. And it often gets lost in our contemporary spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ.